as sci-fi series go, Doctor Who has a less impressive track record in influencing the onward march of technology than Star Trek, for example. However, this is a show about time travel, and as such, it sometimes makes some fairly spot-on predictions, purely by accident. So with that in mind, I'm Ellie with Who Culture here with 10 times Doctor Who accidentally predicted our future. Number 10. The Return of the Weakest Link in 2005's Bad Wolf, Russell T Davis depicts a nightmarish future where reality television has run rampant. A vast game station orbits the Earth, stacked floor to ceiling with studios producing futuristic versions of some old favourites, but with murderous results. On Big Brother you get evicted from life, while a makeover show will eviscerate your unsightly body parts. Anne Robinson, the host of the UK version of the game show The Weakest Link, also made a cameo as the voice of, well, herself. Just a deadlier robot version. The the weakest link eventually went off the air in 2012 when Robinson declined to renew her contract. As various reality shows and talent competitions were dwindling at that time, this was probably a wise move. But then in 2021, the show returned to our screens. There weren't any killer androids, but instead a much more affable host in the form of comic and former maths teacher Ramesh Ranganathan. Whether this format runs until the year 200,000 remains to be seen, however. Number 9. Ice Volcanoes Terry Nation's 1973 serial Planet of the Daleks was the latest in a long line of serials involving treacherous jungles, Daleks and rebels. It also accidentally predicted a major scientific discovery of the late 1980s. The climax of the story sees the Dr. Joe and the Thals stop the Daleks by exploding an active volcano around them, with Nation's unique twist being that the planet has ice volcanoes. Therefore, rather than molten lava, the Daleks are destroyed by molten ice, if ice can be molten. By the end of the story, the the Dalek Supreme is forced to defrost his army and call for rescue from High Command. In the real world, in August 1989, the Voyager spacecraft flew past Triton, Neptune's largest moon. Are we still talking about Doctor Who or Star Trek? On the flyby, Voyager obtained images of something very similar to what Nation had imagined back in 1973. NASA's website elaborates, Many of these pits are aligned in chains similar to those seen in basaltic volcanic areas on Earth, such as craters of the Moon National Monument in Idaho, except the lava on Triton are water and other ices that erupted onto the surface. Who said Nation was a lazy writer? Come on. Number 8. NFTs Douglas Adams had a galaxy-sized brain, stuffed full of bold sci-fi concepts and comic wit. It's unsurprising that he essentially and entirely accidentally predicted the current craze of non-fungible tokens, which even sounds like a race of Doctor Who monsters. After all, what is Count Scarlioni's ingenious Mona Lisa scheme but a high-stakes NFT scam? Like an NFT, the buyers of the Count's Mona Lisa duplicates have paid a large amount of money for something that is actually easily duplicated. If you've been splintered across time and have dragged Leonardo da Vinci into your grand plan, that is. Of course, City of Death is a satire on the art world. If time travel can allow you to duplicate invaluable artworks, then do they really have any value? Also, what's the point in spending obscene amounts of money just to own something that should be enjoyed in a gallery? The NFT situation is the logical next step of this for the digital era, and feels like some elaborate satire of the art world. The obscene investments in Bored Ape would have amused Douglas Adams if he were alive today. Number 7. BBC Three when Doctor Who returned in 2005, BBC Three was the home for follow-up show Doctor Who Confidential and regular repeats in the days before iPlayer existed. However, BBC Three's connection to Doctor Who goes back much further than that. The Demons, 1971 stone-cold classic of sentient stone gargoyles and satanic worship, accidentally predicted the channel's existence. The BBC Three in that story was a more highbrow affair than the youth-oriented channel it's known as today. Rather than screening RuPaul's Drag Race and two pints of lager and a packet of crisps, it broadcasts live feeds of archaeological digs. It's through the BBC Three broadcast that Sergeant Benton and Captain Yates learn of the strange goings-on in Devil's End, as all hell breaks loose, live on television. It's not difficult to trace a line between this and the use of contemporary news broadcasts in Russell T Davis's era of Doctor Who. Bring back Trinity Worlds! After a brief spell as an online-only service, BBC Three is now back as a broadcast channel, just in time for RTD's return to the show. Maybe this is where the rumoured revamp of Doctor Who Confidential will live. We can only hope. Number 6. The 1985 Hiatus 1985's infamously grisly serial Vengeance on Varos is a Doctor Who story that commented on the burgeoning trade in so called video nasties. It also gleefully depicted torture, hangings, and horrific medical experiments. 
The writing was on the wall for Doctor Who during season 22. BBC One controller Michael Grade was no fan of the series and was considering cancelling it. The violence and horror within Vengeance on Varus is a perfect example of the brutal tone to which Grade reportedly objected, though in later years this reasoning has been brought into question. Regardless, there is a sense that the violence is being amped up during Colin Baker's first season. And with this in mind, Vengeance on Varos's part one cliffhanger is oddly prophetic. The Doctor drops to the floor, exhausted, dehydrated, and seemingly close to death. It cuts to the studio gallery where a production assistant counts down the clock before pulling the plug. A few months later, and Michael Grade would be doing the exact same thing. Number five, our over-reliance on computer systems. The 1967 serial The Ice Warriors was influenced by the spectre of a nuclear winter and the resultant food shortages. While those are still very pressing concerns in the present day, another element of the story sticks out more in retrospect. The base in which the story takes place is incredibly reliant on computers, something which may lead to their downfall. The base's leader, Clent, is, like many a social media and streaming service user today, a slave to machine learning. He will not make a decision on anything unless he's consulted the computer first. This horrifies the Doctor, who insists on making his own calculations. It's clearly writer Brian Hales responding to the massive imposing computers of the period. However, in today's Twitter-obsessed generation where original thought is a rare commodity, it's easy to concede that he may have had a point. The Doctor saves the day by convincing Clint to go against the advice of the computer, and use the weather-controlling Ionizer to defeat the advancing Ice Warriors. The message of the serial's climax is that it's healthy to question the algorithm and take a risk every now and then. Is worth heeding, I might add. Number 4. Margaret Thatcher the Sixth Doctor was an advisor to Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s stage play Doctor Who The Ultimate Adventure and its audio adaptation. Much like Winston Churchill before her, she doesn't feel like the sort of politician the Doctor would hang out with. But there we are. However, it wasn't the Doctor who predicted Thatcher's rise to power. It was a line ad-libbed by Nicholas Courtney as the Brigadier which accidentally predicted Thatcher's election as Prime Minister in 1979 and lent weight to the theory that the unit stories take place in the 1980s. During the final episode of 1975's Terror of the Zygons, as the Loch Ness Monster advances towards the Thames, the Brigadier takes a call from the Prime Minister. Oh, absolutely understood, madam. No public announcement. Yes, madam. Discreet action. Discreet but resolute. In 2005, Russell T. Davis made his views on Mrs. Thatcher perfectly clear by having Harriet Jones commit a sci-fi version of the sinking of the Belgrano. The Tenth Doctor ensured that Jones be removed from office in retaliation. Make of that what you will. Number 3. Plant-Based Diets The 1973 serial The Green Death is one of Doctor Who's finest stories. It's a contemporary ecological thriller that tackles the decline of local industry and the damaging environmental impact of big business. It also has giant maggots in it. Barry Letts and co-writer Robert Sloman's Green Agenda was ahead of its time, preceding wider discussions on similar topics a decade later. Jo and her future husband, Professor Clifford Jones, depart the story in search of a protein-rich fungus that may provide a renewable food source. These days it's called corn. Doctor Who's quote-unquote vegan agenda is also on display in 1985's Revelation of the Daleks. Davros has wriggled his way into the good graces of important galactic figures by providing them with a renewable food source that will solve the galaxy's food shortages. The only problem is that this new food source tastes a lot like Soylent Green. The Doctor puts a stop to Davros's dodgy dealings and suggests that the populace of Necros cultivate the local flowers as an alternative. It shares quality with Earth's soya plant, and once again, the Doctor is preaching the benefits of a plant-based diet. Number 2. The Doctor Carrying the Olympic Torch the off-derided Series 2 episode Fear Her features two bold predictions about the near future, as it was then. One is that X Factor winner Shane Ward would have a glittering musical career that resulted in a Greatest Hits album rather than a stint in Coronation Street. The bigger prediction was that, during the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics, a scared little girl would trap the whole of Olympic Park inside a drawing. Of course, that didn't happen, even if it's less insane than the Queen parachuting out of a plane. The episode's climax sees Rose save the day, returning the Doctor and the the TARDIS to the real world just in time for the Doctor to take the Olympic torch and get the competition officially started. When the real 2012 Olympics came to London, however, the 10th Doctor wasn't present. After all, he had regenerated two years previously. Instead, Matt Smith carried the torch through the streets of Cardiff at the start of the torch relay's eighth day. Smith even offered to do it in his underpants, but his offer was declined. Number 1. The 10th Planet 
William Hartnell's swan song, The Tenth Planet, not only introduced one of the series' most enduring monsters in the form of the Cybermen, but it also predicted the existence of a tenth planet. Of course, the planetary status of the ninth, Pluto, is contentious. In 2005, another celestial body was discovered in our galaxy by a team of scientists. The discovery was announced as the tenth planet in our solar system, but the status of the body was uncertain, and the discovery fed into ongoing discussions around ninth planet Pluto's planetary status. This the tenth planet was eventually named Eris, after the Greek goddess of strife and discord. Before this, it was referred to as Xena, in reference to Lucy Lawless's warrior princess. Car, what a show that was. Like Pluto, Eris is classified as a dwarf planet, the new classification introduced in the mid-2000s. The tenth planet was set in 1986, so the discovery of Eris was a few decades late, though mercifully it wasn't heralded by a horde of advancing Cybermen, so. I'd say that's a win. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed something, then please let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell so you never miss a Who Culture video ever again. Also, head over to Twitter and Instagram and TikTok to follow us there. I've been Ellie with Who Culture, and in the words of River Song herself, goodbye, sweetie.